Hello, and welcome to Leader Folk, an inclusive look inside the Jewish community. I'm your host, Sarah Bogomolny. I'm so thrilled to welcome our guest today, Caroline Rothstein. She is an internationally touring writer, poet, and performer. Her work has appeared widely, including Cosmopolitan, Marie Claire, The Guardian, Narratively, The Forward, and Hey Alma, among many others. She's also been featured in publications such as The New Yorker, MTV News, and CBS Evening News. She's been performing spoken word poetry, public speaking, facilitating workshops, and teaching at colleges, schools, performance venues, summer camps, and community organizations for over a decade. And she's also on the faculty for the Foundation of Jewish Summer Camp's annual Cornerstone Fellowship and has worked with a wide range of Jewish organizations throughout the country and the world. Welcome, Caroline. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. I always love to start with a big question, um, (laughs) which is, what is your Jewish journey and how did you end up where you are (laughs) doing what you're doing? How long do we have? As long as you want. (laughs) Um, Wow. Starting big. Um, I love it. Thank you again for having me. So my Jewish journey and how I ended up where I am. Uh, I am 37 as we are recording this. Um, I grew up in the north suburbs of Chicago in a reformed Jewish household which feels complicated to say, because it's like, what does that even mean um, to like align or identify solely with one thing? But it was a a Jewish household by all intents and purposes. And we went to a reform synagogue, which for sure shaped my Jewish journey and my upbringing, my understanding. But I think one of the most critical pieces to my Jewish journey is that as a young child, my father taught me about the importance of asking questions and that that was a very Jewish thing. And he was like, Caroline, you can question everything. You can even question God. And I think that level of possibility for interrogation, and I'm going to intentionally use that word in the moment we're in in this world, I think it gave me permission to feel like I had the freedom to ask whatever questions I wanted to ask in Jewish spaces, in non-Jewish spaces, about the world, about justice. And so for me... Growing up in this reform synagogue, you know, I was like an overachieving, intense, I'm an intense person, period, but I was like a very intense academic student. So that became my approach to Hebrew school was like, okay, we're going to learn that prayer. I'm going to learn it perfectly. Okay, everyone's going to read eight verses in the Torah for their B mitzvah. I'm going to chant 40. Like that was my approach, but it meant that in addition to being like high attempting to be this like intensely highly achieving receptacle for knowledge, I was receiving knowledge and I was like collecting all this intel that I think when I got to college and, and left home and started to see the expansiveness of Judaism and the Jewish community and like understand that if I went to a Shabbat service, my options were, all these different denominations and kinds. It was like, whoa, am I Jewish enough? Am I not Jewish? Like there were all these things I started to wrestle with. So I think it was in college where I started to understand that the Jewish experience was so much bigger than what I had grown up with, which I already knew growing up, but I didn't like have evidence-based knowledge yet, if that makes sense. And Uh, I, you know, it's hard for me to talk about my Jewish journey without talking about politics. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania, which has a very large Jewish population of all different denominations and backgrounds. And I was very involved in activism. And this was like 2002 to 2006 is when I was an undergrad. So I was engaged in a lot of anti-racism work, a lot of uh, LGBTQ plus rights work, um, a lot of feminist work. Um, I ran the vagina monologues. I did a lot of activism around sexual assault prevention and response. And I was in Penn's spoken word poetry group. And so all of this activism and artistic work was happening for me outside the classroom. And it meant that like, I didn't spend a lot of time at Hillel, but I spent a lot of place, a lot of time in all these other places on campus. And I was building community um, across communities 
and instead of just within the Jewish world. And so I think that meant that by the time I reached my late 20s, early 30s and felt disconnected from Jewish spaces, even though I had always engaged with my Judaism and even though my Jewishness has always unapologetically been a part of my work, whether my audience is Jewish or not, I started to feel that... um, that I wanted to, it was like, sort of like leaving home and then coming back. Like I realized that all this community building work and activism I had done everywhere else also like had space in the Jewish world and simultaneously, or perhaps it was like happening all at once, the Jews like discovered I existed professionally. And so my gigs went from being mostly not Jewish to mostly Jewish And then that meant that I was meeting other Jewish artists, Jewish educators. Uh, My gigs were suddenly, instead of at like all colleges and universities, suddenly like a lot of Hillel's or a lot of synagogues or all Jewish summer camps. And so it meant that in addition to like bringing my work into those spaces, those spaces were impacting me. And so I think I find myself now at 37 Uh, I describe myself as a buffet style Jew. I take what I want and I leave the rest. But I also feel like, you know, a lot of the issues I was centering and orienting my organizing around in college and even in high school um, are also issues that are problems in the Jewish community. And like, we have an issue with racism within the Jewish community and with how the Jewish world um, builds an anti-racist world. And so for me, being able to take all of that into the Jewish community. I now feel like uh, it's, it's, I don't want to say full circle because I hope I have many years ahead of me for things to continue to circle and spiral and shape shift, but it does feel a kind of full circle that I've like found a space for myself in, in my Judaism, in the Jewish community at large that did not feel like it existed until recently. I'm also um, a performer. I also have a background in theater and a little bit in writing. And I would love to hear your perspective on how that education or experience of kind of putting yourself out there feeds your your Jewish leadership work. So I'm intrigued by the, I know this is called leader folk. So it's like, I'm I'm on here perhaps in the <laughs> pretense of that word, but but I I'm like curious on like um what like what like am I a leader in this space? Am I doing Jewish leadership work? So that's like the first thing that I'm like, huh. But but in terms of the the performing and writing, I mean, you know, for me, like I literally. I quite literally, my, my art, I don't know how to say it, but like literally my art and, and art has saved my life, um, quite literally. And so the ability to get to share that art with other people outside of a vacuum in that, like, when I do live performances, there are people in the audience and even virtual, as has been the case during the pandemic, I'm still able to receive people's responses or reactions, or maybe we have an interactive Q&A, or maybe they say something to me after. And the gift of someone being witness to art so that it becomes a collaborative experience and not just like me at a mic at people, but us in a space collectively is, I, I really like, I don't know. I I am supposed to be a professional words person, but I like I literally I don't have language to articulate how powerful that is and what a gift it is and how grateful I am for that. And being able to uh, run workshops and teach courses that empower others to do the same with their own voice is like uh, I, I just and I mean voice expansively, not just physical voice, but like the internal voice that is then expressed, however it's expressed, like that is a, a gift. And so I think to me, that is the, 
that is also the cycle. That is also the receptivity. Like I, I feel so blessed to be able for those things to be collaborative and not just me into a void. I love the way that you put that. It, also, because it just reminds me of the Jewish approach to worship in general, mm. and maybe not every single stream of Judaism all of the time, but I think this idea of being witness to the worship in collaboration with each other, it it rings so resonantly um, as a parallel to what you're talking about with your work. I love that. That's beautiful. So you've mentioned an your anti-racist work several times, and I am so curious to hear about how that works in um, a Jewish space or from Jewish thought in Jewish communities, because as we are all bearing witness to the Black Lives Matter movement gaining steam, I think that it's a big question for the Jewish community. How do we respond? How do we step up? How do we listen? And... I would love to know what your thoughts are, especially given that it sounds like you've really been thinking on this topic for a lot longer than maybe some of our colleagues and peers. Yeah. Whew. Thank you, Sarah. I, I first want to say that like, uh, this is lifelong work. And so it's, um, it's messy. And like, even though I like have been doing this work for a very long time, I feel like I'm messing up constantly and I am constantly asking questions and wondering um, what to do and where. So I just want to like name that, like, uh, you know, as a white person, like this is, this is lifelong work for me. And like, I often say that like, as a Jew, that complicates my whiteness because like if literal, if literal Nazis took over tomorrow, my whiteness is subject to change, but it doesn't take away my whiteness now or my white privilege. And it doesn't also erase the fact that like many of my ancestors that were in the United States before me were not seen as white quite yet. So I think my friend Sonia Renee Taylor, who's a poet and activist and organizer, recently made a video on YouTube about like the conversation we need to be having is about whiteness and about what whiteness has done for the world and white supremacy. And I think what's really complicated for Jews and my I'll speak as personally as I can for me as a white person, as a Jewish person in the United States I have to be continually interrogating both those things with us without erasing anti-Semitism and understanding that anti-Semitism is also a subset of white supremacy. And it is also possible to be Jewish and to be complicit in enabling white supremacy. And I would argue that those of us who are white or white passing and Jewish as well, in our effort to assimilate for our literal survival as a result of hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years of anti-Semitism in Europe and the Middle East and Persia and Northern Africa and throughout the world, we have had to assimilate those of us that are white and white passing into whiteness in the United States. And it has meant that we have erased the experience of Jews of color. We have erased the inherent multicultural nature of the Jewish community worldwide. And we have been complicit in upholding systemic racism in the United States of America and other parts of the world. And I understand that the experience for Jews in different parts of the world varies based on the history of colonialism, imperialism, and oppression of any kind in those countries. But I think what's really hard in the United States is that 
for Jews that again are white and or white passing, we have to wrestle with those realities. And so much of um, I might start crying. So much of the, the I don't like to use the term the Jewish establishment because like, what does that even mean? But so much of the structures, literal brick and mortar and organizations we have created as Jews throughout the last hundred years plus in the United States have been oriented around that survival of assimilation which means that we have not made our spaces anti-racist and the spaces that have been able to make themselves anti-racist are, are not receiving the funding and support and recognition they need, many of which have been created by Jews of color and have centered themselves around Jews of color, as we all must do in order to actually uphold the liberation we claim we care so much about every single Pesach. And so it's hard because there are Jews who the world would see as white, who will not identify as white. And I understand how complicated that is, but it is as politically vital. All identities are political in a world where we oppress each other. And until we stop oppressing each other, identity is political and our bodies are political. But in order for us to unravel from this mess we have created on earth, we have to be, we have to be clear about what our bodies are and how our bodies are perceived in order that we can start to see each other's bodies and make it so that black and brown bodies are no longer targets of police brutality in unconscionable ways. Thank you. Yes, that is such an incredibly powerful summary of the complicated, complicated thing that is the conversation about Judaism and racism in America. And I I just, I thank you for bringing that to us. Um, just last week, I know that you published an article uh, alongside a friend about how to start these conversations within our families. What might that look like? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So the article was uh, co-authored with my sister, Natalie Rothstein. Uh, who is a psychotherapist with a private practice in Chicago. uh, And she's also an educator and consultant. Uh, And we, you know, we have had our own journeys towards anti-racist work. And we've also had shared journey because we are siblings collectively doing this work and we share values um, and politics around creating an anti-racist world. And so, you know, I think it's hard to say what that looks like when talking to, um, when white Jewish people are talking to white family members, um, Jewish or not, um, that can be really complicated and painful because um, on top of whatever identities we are all wrestling with, Family dynamics can vary from family to family and come with their own complicated histories, including multi-generational, intergenerational trauma. And so I think, you know, as, as my sister Natalie and I talk about in the guide that we put together for Hey Alma, I think the first step is, is setting up group guidelines and agreements, which is what I do, my sister does, other educators I know do when we facilitate workshops of any kind. And I think sometimes we forget that like we need consent and we need terms of comfort in order to be able to have conversations that might be uncomfortable. And I, I always say that transparency builds consent and accountability. And I think that it's that transparency, those um, guidelines for, for as much safety as possible 
since not everything, is, there's no such thing as a safe space. Something can be safe for one person and unsafe for someone else. So I think recognizing um, those realities and then making space for the conversation by, by having tools that allow family members to hear each other and to hear themselves, right? Like we need to first be honest with ourselves on who we are before we can have, com well, as we have conversations with other people. Because if we wait too long to be honest with ourselves, then we may not ever talk with anyone else. But we, we it, it, you know, it, it needs to be happening in tandem. And then I think from there, you know, we lay out various talking points um, that came up that the editor had pulled from lots of things they had been receiving about conversations and topics people wanted to um, discuss in the readership. But, you know, I think what's really complicated is, you know, it, you know, Judaism, one of the many incredible things about Judaism is that we orient ourselves around ritual and we orient ourselves around quote unquote home, whatever home may be, whether that is, um, a brick and mortar synagogue or a minion that we go to or our actual home, if we have one or um, our Shabbat table or our summer camp or the teen tour we did when we were 15, like whatever it is, we are in the business of building quote home. When people get married in Judaism, the chuppah is literally there to symbolize this notion that we are making open communal space and I think that the more we can rely on actually living our Jewish values and elevating the incredible tools and rituals and values and teachings we already have in Judaism, that helps us unlock what needs to be non-negotiable in being anti-racist. I've heard you use the word consent and I'm wondering if you can kind of explain what that means in this context. Yeah. So I think we often think of consent as only being connected to sex or physical experiences. And I actually think consent is everything. And that if we, when we make it possible to think about consent in everything, and we start to notice the ways consent is, inher or is inherently part of our ways of operating in good ways or in, in consensual ways, I'll say, then we start to realize how much power consent can give us in doing anything. So at a restaurant, if we remember what restaurants are, <laughs> given what we're going through in this world, um, when someone says, may I take your order or what would you like? That's consent. Someone is creating a term by and through which you will communicate and hopefully whatever you order is what you will get and being thankful that you have access to food in the first place, right? And so like, to me, if I'm not in a space to be able to have a conversation and someone starts to force it upon me, I'm not going to show up my best self. And then that's going to, hurt that. It's just not going to work. But if someone says, hey, can we make space for this? Or hey, this weekend, what if we spent some time talking about XYZ? You have opened up the terms of consent, and then you get to all show up, right? Like the reason consent is so vital in physical intimacy is because it allows people to know how they want to and how they will show up. And when they no longer feel comfortable, um, they will name, they, they will hopefully have the space to name that. And more than anything, someone will hear them and respect that and honor that and witness that. It is when those things are not witnessed that we break the terms of consent and we end up with the terribly messy world we're in. Racism to me is, is non-consensual. Some people have decided that other people's bodies are like can be oppressed. That is not consensual. Colonialism, imperialism, those are not consensual things. And so most of the systemic oppression, if not all, that we are 
aware of in the world is the result of breaking the terms of consent and deciding that we can dictate how other people's body experience the world. And if we operated under the terms of consent for everything we do, we would literally honor each other's bodies, which again is something we are taught about the sacredness and holiness of bodies in Judaism. If we bring it back to consent, we would never want to harm another body. And that would include, we would never want to oppress anyone. We should never want to oppress anyone. What do you think are some ways that individuals and maybe organizations in the Jewish community can start incorporating this idea of consent in the work that we do in our communities? I think, again, transparency is really important. I I get my... Uh, menstrual hygiene products from an organization called Lola. So I get like a box of tampons mailed to me every month. And Lola, uh, this menstrual hygiene organization, sent out an email yesterday for everyone that subscribes. And they transparently named the demographic breakdown of their employee base. And they named the ways they are going to work to create an anti-racist organization in addition to the ways that it impacts the community, AKA all of us that buy from them every month. That transparency helps us as their community and their purchasers hold them accountable. And that also changes the way that we want to then market their products. Now that I know that they're transparent, I feel more comfortable telling people to get Lola products. You know what I mean? And now I actually also feel comfortable reaching out to them and saying, wow, thank you for doing this. And I was wondering, have you ever also thought about trans inclusivity with the way that you're doing marketing and messaging, right? And so I think transparency is a place to start. Being transparent within the organization, how things work. The lack of transparency is a result of white supremacy and patriarchy and capitalism and all of its cognates. And so I think organizations have to be transparent within their organizations on how things work and how things operate and why they operate the way they do. And then be transparent with everyone who engages with their organization by modeling that transparency, because it also then invites conversations that keep everyone connected and committed and invested and engaged. And I think that that's like a really powerful place for folks to start. There was a really, there have been a lot of hashtags going around Twitter where different industries are now disclosing information that people kept secret. And in the publishing world, like a white male shared that he got an $800,000 advance for his debut novel. Do you know how many of the most vital Black female authors of our time received a f- not even a fraction of that. I mean, like Roxane Gay's debut book, twelve point five thousand, and 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 her most recent books that we have public info on for the advance, which she has shared, like a hundred thousand or one hundred fifty thousand. I could be misquoting that, but not close to eight hundred thousand. And she's one of the most well-known, vital authors, writers alive. And so that transparency is now allowing the publishing industry to be held accountable. Because for me, as a white person, as a writer whose life dream is to write nonfiction books, now I know what exists for both white men and for, you know, because I'm still a woman in a, in a sexist world, Right. But now I know, huh, one day when God willing, I have the opportunity to get a book deal, if I'm so lucky to have that dream fulfilled, I have information that has been transparently shared with me that can now empower me to ensure that both I am treated well and everyone else is being treated respectfully too, because that matters to me as well. 
I don't want to just get a book deal somewhere and call it a day. I, I hope that if I have the opportunity to get one, I get to also ensure that all artists represented there are being equally treated. I saw that on Twitter as well. I didn't see the man's thing, but I saw Roxane Gay's and it is shocking. And I, I think you're absolutely right about how the transparency is absolutely empowering. I'd like to ask you to kind of shift gears with me. And I would love to hear about what energizes you in your work lately. Um, what brings you joy or inspiration, whether it's in your Jewish work or not? I think... I am so energized by people taking risks and people taking an opportunity to, to speak their truth. And I've had a lot of virtual gigs lately that have included uh, my leading poetry workshops or trainings in ways that uh, people have the space to write and share what they've written. And I'm profoundly energized by people who didn't know, who had decided or the world had decided like they couldn't write a poem, like shocked themselves into like awe because they wrote a poem. And I think, um, and I'm doing that for myself. You know, I'm, I think I've always been afraid of fiction. And so I told myself I could never write fiction. And so I've been playing around with fiction. I've been playing around with some new kinds of projects. Um, I've been playing around with things I thought I might never do as a writer. And I think, I think it's the risk taking that is energizing both to be in partnership with folk as they're taking those risks and to push myself to do the same. I'm so grateful to have had you on the show today because I feel energized and inspired by listening to you, um, listening to you with your Wisdom and certainty, but also being able to own the uncertainty and the messiness of some of these really, really big topics that we grapple with, not only in the Jewish community, but as people and as women. And so I'm just very grateful for your time and your willingness to, to be transparent with us. So thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's an honor and privilege to have been present with y'all today. And I'm, I'm really so grateful for the time. And I'm excited for your future book deal. <laughs> ah! I can't wait. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Leader Folk is all about elevating voices and starting conversations. So now we'd love to hear from you. Email us at podcast at tcjewfolk.com to share your thoughts, your ideas, or to nominate future guests. Leader Folk is a project of Jew Folk, Inc. and the Jew Folk Podcast Network. For more information, visit tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. <laughs>